Hello lovelies, it's officially spooky season and I do not do scary. So this month is all a reflection on mythical creatures and how they relate to our real lives even today. Obviously you can probably tell what the theme of today is from the title but we're all about fairies. But of course because my mind is literally this scene, I'm relating it back to cottagecore and the way that we actually live our lives today and why we have this strong affinity with wanting to get back to nature in the same way that the Victorians and Edwardians did. Cottagecore, obviously as we all know, has been very much a mainstream trend, uh, especially since we're still living in a panoramic, it's like, I just want to go frolic in a field and not have to worry about like the dire states of the world today, fully understand. I mean, we've been spending our lives stuck inside with all the bad news we could ever want at our fingertips. Being expected to still be incredibly highly functioning at work, act like there's nothing wrong with the world, act like there's like no impending doom. And we're meant to feel grateful even for those of us who are working at jobs that are like completely demoralizing, awful, terrible jobs. Because, you know, you're lucky to have a job. Um, yay for people not believing in UBI. You look out of your window into your neighbor's property or at a brick wall. You're trying to blank out the sound of your flatmates in the background on their Zoom calls or the crying baby that's next door. You think of nature. Instead of sweatpants or putting on your itchy uniform, you get to wear light cotton. There's no dark walls to confine you any longer. You're actually outside in a beautiful rolling field with mountains in the distance and a bubbling brook just to the side. The only sounds are that of birdsong, the occasional breeze, and your feet crunching the fresh green grass under your feet. This is the escapism that we've been lusting for. Now, I'm not the first person to be talking about this because Carolina's done a video, a number of other people have done a video on like the history of cottagecore and everything, but I specifically want to focus on fairies and how they strongly actually relate to the way that we've got to cottagecore today. And also how the Victorian era through fairy tales changed like the complete outlook of what fairies are depicted as and we're linking everything with environmentalism, with feminism, with everything. Like there was so much to actually cover in this. I want to tell you though this is not a complete rundown of all of the different kinds of fairies because like when I was looking into this, <laughs> fairy lore is deep. I went down a lot of rabbit holes and if you are one of the people that is really interested in like learning more about fairies and the lore of them and like their history from all different parts of the world, I'll have some channels linked down below for you as well. I'm focusing on the narrowest part around the Victorian and Edwardian era, fairy tales, fairies then and now, like how we've got this evolution. Now this is part of a four part series where I'm actually covering different mythical beings and one that's not so mythical which is next week's. So obviously today it's fairies, then we've got pirates, we've got mermaids and the last one is witches which is the one that I'm the most excited about. If you're watching any of my other videos I know that I did tell you that a thousand subscribers I'm going to do my Marilyn Monroe video. The thing is that I wasn't expecting Tiffany's shout out and there's like 3,000 of you here today. I was hoping for a thousand by the end of the year and that was like a stretch goal. So I'll be doing the Marilyn Monroe video for the first week of November, I promise that. So without any further ado, let's jump straight on into it. Yeah, this beautiful, beautiful work is my inspiration for today, so um, I'm going to try my best. I'm probably going to fail. If I am attempting this, you can attempt anything. Chapter 1 industrialization and the industrial revolution. This very uneducated person did not actually know that there was more than one industrial revolution. Um, we got taught about the Tudors three times in school, the Romans as many times, and also World War II like every single year, but we didn't find out about this. Same as like we didn't find out about the colonization of most of the world either, but hey, it's what you get for growing up in England, huh? It's a fun thing to learn about when you leave school, I'll tell you that. So the first Industrial Revolution was in 1765, second in 1870, and the third in 1969. Nice. And then there's the fourth one, which is Industry 4.0, which is the one that we're actually in today. Like, how do you make something modern? Put a decimal point in. So since a lot of fairy tales are around Europe, that's kind of where we're focusing things. Even before the Industrial Revolution happened, people had already begun moving from like the rural dwellings into the cities because that was where the jobs were. But then with the Industrial Revolution came more jobs and more ease and less jobs for other people who were considered to be unskilled. Ooh, hello history almost starting to repeat itself. 
small towns turned into massive cities in the space of like just a few decades. And obviously with this rapid urbanization it brought along a lot of struggles as well with it, as of course it would. So we had people suffering from overcrowded cities, pollution, not enough sanitation, lack of clean drinking water. Um, this is why it's important for corporations and business people and everyone to pay the right amount in tax. Even though people are like, but it's there to help you. I'm like, it's there to help certain people. There were actually some people who were super against technological revolution. They really didn't like anything new to do with technology. And they were referred to as Luddites. Who would literally go and destroy machinery and attack like factories because they were so mad at all of this change. They were apparently uh, led by a man named what was it Ted? Oh, Ned Ludd? But that's just a theory. I mean he could have been a straw man like you don't want anyone to like really find out about like the fact that you're breaking the law and stuff because people prefer property over people. Now you may be thinking of a Luddite as like an old man yells at cloud but at the same time it's like how many of us are like strongly against capitalism now even though capitalism objectively has like done like great things for technological change it's forgotten about one particular thing. What is that? Oh human rights? Yeah, probably that. So that kind of sets the scene for why people had such a hunger for nature to return. The writers. I've had this palette for many years and it's still serving me well. The man who wrote the most sad story in the world, The Little Mermaid. Like, his work was very popular at this time and he was one of like the key people in terms of like the golden age of fairy tales. So you had other people like Lewis Carroll, there were a number of other famous poets, playwrights, other writers, painters during this time too. I can't talk and cut my crease at the same time so please enjoy this voiceover. The Victorian era really actually got fairy tales going. They were actually writing them down instead of them just being spoken. Now whilst a lot of these stories had actually been around for years with typically women retelling them and a bunch of men making them into quote unquote proper stories for the first time by Victorian and Edwardian writers. Of course this was the time of Brothers Grimm too who also did not write most of their own stuff and instead took them from women. Huh. Hey patriarchy. Nice to see you with us. Again. There was absolutely a real focus on teaching morals and being blinded by your eyeshadow. So pretty. And whilst at the beginning there was this fascination with cities and what they could offer, they were exciting but they were dangerous. I mean Charles Dickens was around in this time. You know like think of Oliver Twist for example. Charles Dickens took fairy tales so so seriously he actually wrote a massive piece just about them about how people were misrepresenting them, how they were telling them wrong. He was honestly like throwing hands using all caps to like slander an old friend of his in like this massive piece of work that was like effectively the burn book of the 19th century. It was a big deal. The typical focus was still on nature having like this or of mystery around it, you know, like the city was like sooty, dirty and crowded and rigid and like, ugh. Like, you felt cramped in a city. In nature it was unruly, unpredictable and just free. Another thing to note is that the 19th century really spelled the way for science kind of being like the main focus for the future. Now of course as someone who celebrates science, like if you've seen any of my other videos you know that I like to refer to scientific consensus. I'm not a scientist but I do appreciate the work except for the animal testing part. So whilst I don't connect with the concept of like fearing science, I do connect with the concept of like living in fear for the future. Um, and I'm sure that most of us do as well. Like people were afraid to drink the water, which is fair because this was from the River Thames. And so like the idyllic version of nature that people kind of conjured at other points in time as well. Like being a farmer is actually not <laughs> a glamorous life as I'm sure any farmer will w willingly and readily tell you. My like, interests were rife and working conditions were absolutely atrocious. And so of course people escaped to fairy tales. But what they did was they brought nature into their homes. <laughs> And they had like wallpapers, they would press flowers. If you were very rich you could have a potted plant and if you were very very rich you could have a little patch of garden outside the back of your terrace house. Basically any way that people could find a way to actually escape. Similar today but like today we've got like TikTok and Instagram and YouTube and stuff. Chapter 3. Nature. Wild but sacred and the impact that fairies had. Maria Tater, a German folklore and children's literature scholar at Harvard University said, Forests are sublime and dangerous, full of mystery, magic, terror and monstrosity, an enchanted place where anything can happen. On the one hand, the forest is a site of threats, the precinct of monsters, the wolf waiting for Red Riding Hood, the witch for Hansel and Gretel, the briars covering Sleeping Beauty's castle, but it's also a place where abandoned children can take refuge. 
For example, Snow White flees to the safety of the forest because it's a home that's full of monsters. And of course, forests were like where fairies lived. During this time, it was mostly girls and women that were being depicted. It changed from like this ethereal bulb of light to be an ethereal bulb of a woman. It was of course very very attractive and um, playful and coquettish and like all the other things that like your ideal woman would be because a lot of these were written by men. But fairies were defending nature, they were helping out, they were just playing tricks, they were dancing around, they were frolicking and there was a real childhood innocence to fairies as well. It's like they didn't realise how bad some of the things they were doing were. More instances of females being infantilised but that's that could be another topic if you want me to go into that because there's a deep history around infantilization of women and um, power over them. A common fear was that fairies were actually going to steal your child and replace it with a changeling and this changeling would be blamed for a child having a deformity or not being able to walk or having an illness or just being weird and different. Um, nothing like ableism just creeping on in there, huh? But they got a really really romanticized version during this time. But fairies were also feared, quite similar to how witches were, just because all women are bad. Now fairies actually also got given wings during this time which had never happened before. It gave them an image of being kind of harmless because it's like if they're associated with a bug and it's like a bug could never really hurt you hurt you but a witch absolutely could. If you're interested in any of like the fears of females and femphobia and stuff I've got a whole video on it up here. Highly recommend going and checking that out. Now also fairy scholars were genuinely a thing. Anytime that people um, go off about masculinity today please remember that there were grown ass men who were paid to discuss whether something belonged to a fairy or not and the origins of fairies it was taken so very seriously. The science of fairy tales, the folklore society, like seriously look it up, like it's a huge thing. So anytime that people are like, oh we don't have real men anymore, it's a construct first of all, <laughs> but then like seriously in the past we were never this binary. <laughs> and this is of course until it was no longer highly regarded and science fully took over. Fun fact for any of you dancers out there, so fairies actually influenced the way that dance happened as well. So the first time that someone ever danced on point you know like how ballerinas do today that was when they were depicting a fairy because they wanted them to be like really really light on their feet and like they were basically not even touching the ground and also this photograph right here of the Cottingley fairies caused such a stir in the 1900s no less the people actually believed in fairies again and there was this huge debate about it so the, the truth of these pictures is the fact that the mother had actually just cut out pictures from her kids books and then put them on cardboard and staged them in like the back garden and that's what happened <laughs> but hey there's nothing like ye old conspiracy theory <laughs> in the days before twitter chapter four fairies and media so with all of these fairy tales and the recognition that children were actually children and not just small adults um a very good thing the image of fairies stuck around and they got a lot more soft a lot less evil and malicious <laughs> and they also became much more synonymous with children and fantasy stories i mean it's like the golden age of fairy tales happened in the victorian era and of course this started a trend that would only actually continue now the edwardians also had an affinity with nature and fairies but it was actually more in a it was in a more whimsical way for example you had things like peter pan come about in 1904 and the softening and retelling fairy tales became even more palatable with like the short film coming around like for example we can't deny the huge effect that snow white and seven dwarfs had on things and that came out in 1938 whilst there was no specific fairy involved in that i do want to just raise the fact that there were also no hot iron shoes that the evil queen had to dance in until she kicked the bucket same as like in sleeping beauty like there were good fairies there's always the bad fairy maleficent but then there's but she was never really referred to as a fairy though was she she was almost more akin to a sorcerer. We never really saw her as a fairy in the way of the other fairies. It's like there was a distinction that was made, which we'll talk about more in the witch video. And like, for example, they took away the R word that actually happened to Aurora, and uh, the fact is that she actually got woken up by giving birth. <laughs> So a lot of things were sanitized, diluted, and this has just been a trend that's continued ever since the Victorian era actually started with their fascination with fairy tales and this escapism notion. You think about it with the Blue Fairy and Pinocchio, all the way to Tinkerbell and her friends today. And of course things like the Winx Club too. Can't forget the, the cartoon. <laughs> so nowadays fairies are tied much more in with nature 
and elements and they've got specific powers that they can tap into. It's kind of like a way to connect us back again with the outside. Fairies have become a part of escapism, almost like nature has as well because it's it's not something that we've all got easy access to in terms of like being able to actually go into nature nature because you've got buildings everywhere, you've got work, like you've got so many constraints in our lives that like having this same as cottage core as like a way of escapism is like controlling the aesthetics that you can because you can't control the fact that we live in a capitalistic society that demands us to be productive all the time and even then we still can't get by. <laughs> So they're much more akin to what I think of like cottagecore, environmentalists, and figures that kind of like recognise just how um, magical nature really is, you could even say. Okay, look at Fern Gully from the 90s <laughs> in terms of like fairies and nature and being like super intertwined. Like that's kind of what comes to my mind when I think of fairies, but I also can barely watch that movie because I'm very scared of hexes. I mean, talk about 90s movies being like Mwah! for um, creating little environmentalists out of us all, hey? Now a lot of people actually said in like which movies to watch, Shrek came up a lot, so Shrek 2 for example is a bit of a subversion of this trope, right? Because you have the fairy godmother, but it's like she's a fairy who figured out how to manipulate the whole system instead, which I almost think is like more of an allegory of Disney. Hear me out, I know I've made a lot of videos on Disney, but still hear me out. Because like you've got this gorgeous magical figurehead and like the little image of like the little cottage by the, the river and it's all very cute and that's why they make the magical po magical potions like make your dreams come true when in reality <laughs> it's like this absolutely giant factory that is like polluting the environment, owns everything, manipulates all situations to work for it and the workers are being exploited and they have to secretly discuss unions but you know like <laughs> I could be just pulling things out of my hair. Chapter 5 Feminism and Environmentalism so fairies have also evolved, like I said before, from the Victorian era to be specifically feminine, as in a very cishet feminine. Now, one example which always will come up is the fact that the Winx Club actually lent into this like in a pretty good way because they had male fairies. Fern Gully also had male fairies, but for the most part, fairies are female. The one thing that the Winx Club also had <laughs> that most other forms of fairies don't is, oh my gosh, diversity in terms of race. If you think about like the paintings of fairies in particular, it, from even from the Victorian era onwards, like they're a very softened version of feminine, like very traditional feminine beauty. You could be arguing that this is actually a positive thing, as it's showing like this strong affinity with like Mother Nature. But me personally, I haven't really seen many males putting like the planet over profits. That's just not something that I've really seen very much of. And do not start suggesting Bill Gates. Because the first thing I'll do is I will just direct you to Kristen Leo's video right here as your starting point. It's almost like from, at least from what my algorithm shows me, that females have kind of become this figurehead for environmentalism. And of course in particular with the youth of today, something which I'm so glad to see. Now fairies also have strong female friendships, which is something which has been quite overlooked in the past because it really does get us away from that whole n-log attitude that was so prevalent i mean i grew up with it yeah it's really really positive to see that we've shifted away from that now now i really do think that this ties into our whole cottage core obsession that we've been going through for the past few years because it is typically female identifying people who are really appreciating the softness a lot more. In a way we're able to actually just explore the way that we want to explore things and not have to conform to like whatever society wants. Like if you like softer things you can absolutely do that now. Whereas in the past it's almost like from the 80s and 90s you had to like compete with men. So you had to act like a man to be able to be taken seriously. In the 2000s you had to be basically a male fantasy. Which I would argue still went into the 2010s. Um, because you had to be a cool girl um, just watch Gone Girl if you want any more info on that but now like there's this more appreciation of the individual it's like you can be whatever gender you identify or don't, ident or don't identify with I can be as feminine as I want now whereas in the past I kind of felt like I wasn't I was looked down on for being more feminine even though this is what I really enjoy um, there's no one way and I kind of think that Cottage Call really leans into this whole um, like just expression of yourself and just embracing whatever you want because a lot of cottage core fashion whilst it's been capitalized which is, whilst capitalism has got to it and like fast fashion's doing it all the time like it, it's not really something that's like a practical aesthetic it's it's embracing whimsy it's embracing like things that are not considered to be 
of this time because it's very backwards in the same way that the Victorian era really wanted to be able to but they were similarly chokeholded by the fact that you have to live in like a city in a cramped space and all this other stuff to be able to survive. I wanted to add on to that last point as well just the fact that we are actually allowed now to enjoy not working all the time um like previously having any downtime was seen as like you failing there's been this emphasis on degrowth and of like shoving away hustle culture like i've talked about it before um and just the fact that like your time is precious again i've talked about that and just creating boundaries and all of that stuff it's like in the way that the victorian era were getting overworked um obviously <laughs> we're a lot safer than that now but in that same vein, we're still going on those same lines, which is another reason why I think that cottagecore has become such a huge thing. Chapter 5, the whiteness of it all. So there's no escaping from the fact that fairies are a lot paler than even me, right? Like, there really isn't. In general, in terms of, like, most of the paintings about them, most of the media depicting them, unless you're Winx, um, or actually one of the best retellings of Cinderella, just a lot of the thoughts back then was that fairies and like spirits and stuff were from a, a savage place and we know what they mean when they say savages right got the other r word fairies were depicted as these tiny little glowing ethereal beauties of traditional feminine beauty right <sighs> sorry the ideal feminine beauty there's that male gaze and patriarchy. I was almost getting sentimental before. I'm so glad it's back. So just like Cottagecore is harkening back to times where slave ownership was normal and and is still most commonly like depicted by traditionally beautiful skinny white cishet normative girls who are typically wealthy enough with enough time to be able to go frolic in a field. So this same thing still happens with fairies now. Obviously you've got the Winx Club which is an exception but in general it is still very uh, white leaning. Like when I type in black fairy it's mostly like an evil fairy as opposed to like a black fairy you know i know that they did a nude lip with this look but i want pink like you'll have to pry this lipstick away from my cold dead hands i love it that much <laughs> final thoughts history repeats baby we've switched from fairies to influencers frolicking in fields as someone who has run many a mental health workshop had the luck and pleasure of working with psychologists and people trained in the field to help um, staff members that are dealing with change and uh, stress and everything else. Um, I know the importance of nature and how important it is to be able to connect with it even on a daily basis if you're actually able to. Even the way that we're living now is so new to humans because like we would spend way more of our time actually outdoors even like a hundred years ago even my husband and i we've talked about it so many times like being able to move away and just go and be somewhere where it's not like so stressful we were in our 30s we have decent jobs and we can't afford it like we are freaking out about our retirement so i don't know how anyone else is coping so yes being able to live in nature is absolutely a luxury and the thing is that we're tied to our jobs which are in Auckland and it's like where else are you meant to go because that's where the jobs are and centralisation is a thing. So of course what are you going to do if you're stuck living in a place that you don't really want to be in? You're going to control the aesthetics that you can, you're going to change your own little environment like that's why I like to experiment with this around me and that's another reason why I get to play with makeup and stuff. So this is just like the Victorians did with their wallpapers and their pretty pictures and neighbours banging. We get to watch content that is peaceful and happy and beautiful and educational. And that's basically as far as we can really take it. Along with like maybe getting uh, some fashion that can accurately reflect where we'd rather be. Um, if you did make it all the way to the end, please leave the fairy and sparkle emoji because I kind of feel like you need both um, for this. I so, so, so appreciate it. As of today, I hit 3,000 subscribers, which I was not one bit expecting. I'm still blown away by it. I'm still in disbelief. Um, I'm going to go get some Prosecco now. <laughs> the $14 bottle of Prosecco that we had at our wedding. <laughs> Um, if you want to know anything about planning a vegan wedding, by the way, we got married last year. I've got a whole playlist of information about um, how we pulled off our vegan wedding. I did as much secondhand as possible, as much, as much upcycled as possible, like everything. So I've got a whole playlist. I'll link that for you. So if you want to get married, if you don't want to get married, 
screw it do whatever you want as long as you're happy i don't really care thank you to like all of the people that were following me before and like engaging with my content like i still know all of your names and hello to everyone that's new this is very daunting for me because i i didn't really expect <laughs> i wasn't expecting this i wasn't and so thrilled also very intimidated so to celebrate here's my 14 dollars bottle of prosecco before i get started on doing meal prep for the week so cheers if you did enjoy this video as well, um, go check out my video on Aquatafana because like 17th century feminism, all of that stuff, oh my gosh, that was such a trip, that was such a fun video to film and I got a really positive response. So if like you're missing out on that one because you're like, oh it doesn't sound interesting, trust me. I love that video, it's one of my favourites. Anyway, thank you again, bye! Brandon, the cat's throwing up!